Greetings, and welcome to the Advanced Micro Devices Second Quarter 2019 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone to require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is on my pleasure to introduce your host, Laura Graves. Please go ahead. Thank you, and welcome to AMD's second quarter 2019 conference call. By now, you should have had the opportunity to review a copy of our earnings release and slides. If you have not reviewed these documents, they can be found on the Investor Relations page of AMD's website, amd.com. Participants on today's conference call are Dr. Lisa Su, our President and Chief Executive Officer, and Devinder Kumar, our Senior Vice President, Chief Financial Officer, and Treasurer. This is a live call and will be replayed via webcast on our website. Before we begin, I would like to highlight some important dates for you. AMD will officially launch our second-generation EPIC Data Center CPU on Wednesday, August the 7th. On Tuesday, August 27th, Forrest Norod, Senior Vice President and General Manager of our Data Center and Embedded Solutions Group, will present at the Jefferies 2019 Semiconductor Hardware and Communications Infrastructure Summit in Chicago. On Tuesday, September 10th, Devinder Kumar, Senior Vice President, Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer, will present at the Deutsche Bank Technology Conference in Las Vegas. And on Friday, September 13, 2019, our third quarter quiet time is expected to begin at the close of business. Today's discussion contains forward-looking statements based on the environment as we currently see it. Those statements are based on current beliefs, assumptions, and expectations, speak only as of the current date, and as such involve risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from our current expectations. We will refer primarily to non-GAAP financial measures during this call, except for revenue and segment operational results, which are on a GAAP basis. The non-GAAP financial measures referenced today are reconciled to their most directly comparable GAAP financial measure in today's press release, which is posted on our website. Please refer to the cautionary statements in our press release for more information. You will also find detailed discussions about our risk factors in our filings with the SEC and in particular, AMD's quarterly report on Form 10-Q for the quarter ended March 30, 2019. Now with that, I'd like to hand the call over to Lisa. Thank you, Laura, and good afternoon to all those listening in today. We made history in the second quarter, both as the first company to simultaneously launch high-performance CPUs and GPUs, and the first to ramp 7-nanometer high-performance processors across PCs, gaming, and the data center. I am extremely pleased with our execution in the quarter as we ramped production on Ryzen 3000 CPUs, Radeon 5700 GPUs, and early volumes of our second generation EPIC processors in advance of their third quarter launch. Looking at the second quarter, revenue of $1.53 billion increased 20% sequentially driven by growth across both of our business segments. Revenue declined 13% year-over-year in line with our expectations as client and server processor revenue increases were offset by lower graphics channel and semi-custom revenue. Turning to our computing and graphics segment, revenue declined 13% year-over-year as significantly higher client processor sales were offset by lower graphics channel sales. Mobile client processor revenue increased by a double-digit percentage year-over-year year and sequentially, driven by our highest quarterly unit shipments in five years. In desktop, we launched our industry-leading Ryzen 3000 processors, featuring our new Zen 2 core to overwhelmingly positive customer response. Numerous third-party reviews highlighted the superior performance of our 7-nanometer Ryzen CPUs in both multi-threaded and single-threaded applications while consuming less power than competitive offerings. Ryzen 3000 processor customer demand has been very strong, with sales at global e-tailers and retailers outpacing our previous generations of Ryzen by more than three times at the same point following their respective launches. Based on the market response to our latest mobile and desktop processors, and the growing number of AMD-powered commercial and consumer PCs, we expect to gain share in the high volume back-to-school and holiday periods. 
In graphics, revenue decreased year over year, driven largely by lower channel sales, partially offset by a significant increase in data center GPU sales. GPU revenue increased by a double-digit percentage sequentially, driven by increased channel sales of our RX 500 series GPUs and the launch of our Radeon 5700 family. The Radeon 5700 series with our new RDNA architecture delivers up to 1.5 times more performance per watt compared to our previous generation. Initial demand for our new GPUs has been strong as third-party reviewers have highlighted our leadership gaming performance at relevant price points. We are well positioned for growth in the second half of the year as we continue to ramp our Radeon 5000 GPU family. We had another quarter of strong year-over-year -year data center GPU sales growth, driven largely by HPC and cloud wins. We continue making progress expanding this margin accretive part of our business based on our strategy to focus on working closely with marquee customers. We also announced a strategic partnership in the quarter with Samsung to bring Radeon graphics to their future smartphone and mobile SOCs. The partnership showcases our strategy to engage with industry leaders across the ecosystem to drive Radeon everywhere. We now have deep partnerships across the PC, game console, cloud, and mobile markets that contribute to a growing developer ecosystem and installed base for our Radeon graphics architecture. Turning to our enterprise embedded and semi-custom segment, revenue decreased 12% from a year ago due to lower semi-custom revenue. In semi-custom, we have extended our game console leadership as both Microsoft and Sony have now both announced they will use custom AMD SOCs to power their next generation game consoles. We are very proud to power back-to-back -back generations of the world's highest performing game consoles. As we look into the second half of the year, we are seeing additional softness in game console demand, which is now reflected in our full year guidance. In server, CPU revenue grew significantly year over year and sequentially, driven by initial shipments of our next generation ROM processors to lead cloud and OEM customers. First generation Epic processor based cloud deployments continued to increase in the quarter. Amazon expanded availability of its Epic processor-powered instances to more than 15 regions and dozens of new configurations. And Microsoft launched general availability of its Azure HB supercomputing virtual machines that for the first time ever enable customers to run demanding HPC workloads in the cloud. Turning to our next generation Rome server processor, Rome is on time and exceeding expectations, delivering leadership performance and TCO across a significantly expanded number of cloud and enterprise workloads. Customer excitement continues to grow. Compared to our first generation Epic processors, we have more than twice the number of platforms in development with a larger set of partners. We also have four times more enterprise and cloud customers actively engaged on deployments prior to launch. As a result, Rome is on track to ramp significantly faster than our first generation Epic processor. We are seeing particular strength in HPC, where we offer leadership compute density and I.O. We had multiple supercomputing wins in the quarter, including public announcements from Indiana University and Norway's National Research Network. Our supercomputing momentum was highlighted by the U.S. Department of Energy and Oak Ridge National Laboratory selecting both Epic CPUs and Radeon Instinct GPUs to power their next generation Frontier exascale supercomputer built by Cray. Frontier is expected to be the world's fastest computer when it launches in 2021. We look forward to providing more details on Rome at our launch event on August 7th. In summary, as we complete the first half of 2019, we have reached a significant inflection point for the company as we enter our next phase of growth with the most competitive product portfolio in our history. 
We have seen some uncertainties across our supply chain driven by tariffs, trade concerns, and the U.S. entities list. In the second quarter, we stopped shipping to customers added to the U.S. entities list. While we remain cautious given the fluidity of the situation, the impact to date has been limited and offset by growing momentum in other parts of our business. We are executing well to our plans and see a path to significant market share gains for our product portfolio across the PC, gaming, and data center markets in the coming quarters. Now I'd like to turn the call over to Devinder to provide some additional color on our second quarter financial performance. Thank you, Lisa, and good afternoon, everyone. We are pleased with the financial results for the first half of 2019 which provide a solid foundation for the second half of the year. Second quarter revenue of $1.53 billion grew 20% over the first quarter. Gross margin of 41% increased 4 percentage points from the prior year, driven by the ramp of our strong portfolio of high-performance products. Quarterly revenue was down 13% from a year ago. Strong sales of Ryzen and Epic processors and our new Radeon RX 5700 GPUs were more than offset by lower semi-custom sales and lower graphics channel sales associated with blockchain. Operating expenses grew 10% year over year to 512 million, driven primarily by go-to-market activities and new product introductions. Operating income was 111 million, down from 186 million a year ago, primarily due to lower revenue and higher operating expenses. Operating margin was 7%, down from 11% a year ago. Net income was 92 million compared to 156 million a year ago, and diluted earnings per share was 8 cents per share compared to 14 cents per share a year ago. Now turning to the business segment results. Computing and graphics segment revenue was $940 million, down 13% year-over-year, as strong client processor sales were more than offset by lower overall graphics sales due to ne negligible blockchain-related revenue in the second quarter of 2019. Computing and graphics segment operating income was $22 million, compared to $117 million a year ago, primarily due to lower revenue. In the enterprise embedded and semi-custom segment, revenue was 591 million, down 12% from the prior year. Semi-custom revenue was lower and partially offset by significant growth in data center CPU revenue. EESC segment operating income was 89 million compared to 69 million a year ago. The improvement was largely due to growth in data center CPU revenue. Turning to the balance sheet, our cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities total $1.1 billion at the end of the quarter. Year over year, we have reduced gross debt by $392 million, and in the second quarter, we also replaced our asset-backed loan facility with a $500 million secured revolving line of credit. Free cash flow was negative 28 million in the quarter, while cash flow from operations was 30 million. Inventory was 1 billion, up 60 million sequentially, primarily due to increased inventory of our new 7 nanometer products in anticipation of accelerating product sales in the back half of the year. Adjusted EBITDA was 163 million compared to 228 million a year ago due to lower quarterly earnings. On a trailing 12-month basis, adjusted EBITDA was 672 million and gross leverage at the end of the quarter was 1.9 times. Turning to the outlook for the third quarter of 2019, we expect revenue to be approximately 1.8 billion plus or minus 50 million, an increase of approximately 9% year-over-year and 18% sequentially. The sequential and year-over-year -year increases 
I expect it to be driven by Ryzen, Epic, and Radeon product sales, partially offset by lower-than-expected semi-custom sales. In addition, for Q3 2019, we expect non-GAAP gross margin to be approximately 43%, non-GAAP operating expenses to be approximately $525 million, non-GAAP interest expense taxes and other to be approximately $30 million, and third quarter diluted share count is expected to be approximately 1.21 billion shares. For the full year, we now believe revenue will increase mid-single-digit percent over 2018, driven by significant sales growth of our new Ryzen, Epic, and Radeon processors, partially offset by lower-than-expected semi-custom revenue. Revenue, excluding semi-custom, is expected to increase approximately 20% year-over-year. Full-year non-GAAP gross margin is expected to be approximately 42%. In closing, we had a strong first half of 2019. We remain focused on executing to our plans for the remainder of the year and look forward to ramping our new Ryzen and Radeon products as well as the upcoming launch of Rome. With that, I'll turn it back to Laura for the question and answer session. Laura? Thank you, Devinder. Operator, we're ready for our first question, please. Thank you. If you'd like to be placed in the question queue at this time, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to move your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Once again, that's star one to ask a question at this time. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Our first question today is coming from Mitch Steves from RBC Capital Markets. Your line is now live. Hello? Hi, Mitch. It's Laura and the team from AMD. We're ready for you. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so my question is really just twofold. So number one, first on the gross margin side. Um, so you guys are talking about semi-custom coming down pretty materially, and that's kind of the entire reason for the, I guess, the uh, mid-single-digit growth number. So why, I guess, aren't the gross margins expanding a little bit more if you're seeing more traction on the server side? So I think, I think if you look at it from an overall standpoint, you know, in Q2 we did 41%. It's the third quarter in a row of 41% gross margin. And in Q3, you are right, with the decline in semi-custom, uh, there is benefit to the margin, and the margin guide for Q3 is at approximately 43%. I can tell you that, you know, the, the richer product mix, especially with the new products ramping in Q3, are going to drive the gross margin, although there is a benefit from the decline of semi-custom also. Uh, the margin benefit is more weighted towards the, towards the non-semi-custom business, and that's where we end up with the 43% in Q3. We've also updated our, our guidance for 2019, and now are projecting 42% for the year uh, 2019. Right, yeah, so I guess just to follow up on that, so the, the assumption there is that by the end of 19, you guys have more share in the server side. So I guess just high level, if I assume that 2020 uh, gross margins are gonna start going up as well if you, gain, if you keep gaining share in server, is that a fair assumption? Uh, for for the next for the next year or so, I think what I would say is you know we are very pleased with the progress we have made on the margin in 2019. The product mix continues to get richer, and we'll see as we get closer to 2020 in terms of the specifics. But you're right, the product mix does get better. Server and even in the other businesses, including the client business, uh, the product mix uh, being richer benefits the margin. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Vivek Aria from Bank of America. Your line is now live. Uh, thanks for taking my question, and, and good to see the traction in, in the new products. Um, Lisa, for my first question, uh, I was wondering if you could give us some more color around uh, the traction you are seeing in Rome. You know, both from if you are able to quantify it somewhat, but importantly. Um, the attraction you are seeing with customers, whether uh, there is any uh, pricing pressure from your uh, main competitor. And um, I think in the past you had outlined uh, uh, targets to reach uh, certain market share. Just you know, now that the product is out in front of customers, uh, how are you seeing that traction with, with both the cloud and the enterprise side? Yeah, absolutely, Vivek. Uh, thanks for the question. So look, we are very pleased with how Rome is coming up. 
Um, we, uh, we did ship um, initial shipments uh, this past quarter and the second quarter to both cloud and enterprise customers. Um, the feedback that we're getting from customers is that the performance um, is uh, you know, very compelling, uh, both from a performance standpoint as well as a total cost of ownership standpoint. Uh, we've gotten a number of wins um, on both the cloud and the um, enterprise side as well as HPC. Um, you know, from our standpoint, uh, you know, next week is a, a big week for us. Obviously, we're going to officially launch Rome um, on August 7th. Uh, but from a, a customer pull standpoint, um, you know, we see good customer pull. Uh, your question specifically about the pricing environment, um, you know, the pricing environment um, is always competitive. We expect it to be competitive. Um, that being the case, um, in servers, you know, price is not the first, um, uh, the first uh, variable in terms of a, a buying decision. And so, um, you know, we believe the value proposition that we have for Rome from a um, overall standpoint, is very strong, and um, you know we see um, you know good uh, a good pricing environment for that. Uh, thanks, Lisa. And as as my follow up um, on the quantification side, I think in the last quarter you had given us some color around data centers, CPU and GPU, kind of around that mid-teens as a percentage of sales. I was hoping you could give us some sense of uh, what it was in Q2 and just what the outlook is uh, for 2019 or or the second half. Of the year. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, in the second quarter, the percentage is similar uh, to the last few quarters um, in terms of percentage of our business. Um, we were more heavily weighted towards CPU versus GPU um, in the second quarter. So we saw data center GPU uh, sequentially decline as expected. Um, the CPUs um, uh, uh, grew as expected. Um, as we go into the second half of the year, you know, you should expect that the percentage um, of our revenue through the data center uh, will increase as uh, as we ramp home. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Toshi Ahiri from Goldman Sachs. Your line is now live. Great. Um, thanks so much for taking the question. Um, Lisa, obviously it seems like you're making a lot of progress um, with Rome, or at least the initial feedback continues to be very positive. Um, that said, the overall hyperscale environment seems um, pretty slow based on based on commentary from from your peers and, and your customers, I guess. Um, could that impact the ramp into the second half? Is, is that a concern for you going forward? Can I have yeah, a follow up? Sure. So look, um, you know, we certainly have um, have heard the uh, the same conversation, especially around the the cloud environment in the first half of the year. Um, our plan was always very heavily second half weighted, and um, from our standpoint, uh, we have seen a significant you know customer engagement and pull uh, for uh, the Rome product, and uh, you know we see a number of new installations that uh, will come online over the next uh, couple of quarters. So, uh, you know I I, agree, I believe that there is some cloud digestion that's happening out there. Um, I also believe that uh, you know given where we are from the product cycle standpoint. Um, you know, we are well positioned to grow. Got it. And then uh, as a follow-up, um, I was hoping to, to learn a little bit more about, you know, the partnership with, with Samsung, the, the IP um, win in the quarter, and also uh, Frontier on the HPC side. Just from a modeling uh, perspective, how, how should we think about those two uh, deals, if you will, over the next couple of years and, and the accretion to the P&L? Thank you. Sure. So look, um, we're we're very pleased with both. Um, they're both very significant announcements for us. Um, on the Samsung side, it's a multi-year, multi-generational um, you know deal that we have um, across our graphics portfolio for mobile. Um, in terms of 2019, uh, the um, the revenue is approximately 100 million um, that would be uh, you know added. Um, this is this was not originally in our guidance, and it offsets some of the uh, headwinds that we talked about in uh, in semi custom and um, and China. Um, as it uh, as it's not pure IP though, so the way you should think about it is uh, there there is uh, some uh, specific development uh, expenses that are uh, being uh, that are part of that um, that deal, and so you know those will be part of the uh, the, the cogs portion of that. Um, as it relates to Frontier, um, you know Frontier, you know again very um, very significant deal for us. Um, it is um, NRE for the next couple of years to really get the software and infrastructure. I would say that's um, not material. It's a it's a uh, 
a relatively smaller number, and then um, the, uh, the actual deployment will be in 2021. So the bulk of the CPU and the GPU revenue will be in 2021, uh, with may a small portion of that uh, perhaps in the second half of 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Matt Ramsey from Cowan & Company. Your line is now live. Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, Lisa, I think we'll be hearing plenty about Rome next week. I wanted to ask um, some questions about your, your PC business um, going into the back half of the year. Um, the desktop momentum seems there, um, the notebook space. Um, Intel's obviously going on to, to 10 nanometer for a portion of that portfolio, and it seems the 7 nanometer refresh on your side is, is a little bit later. Yet the SKU coverage you've talked about, I think, is 50% higher than it was last year for back to school and holidays. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the momentum in the PC business into the back half and the differences between what you might see in desktop and notebook. Thank you. Yeah, sure, Matt. So, look, we are um, we're pleased with the progress of our PC business. Um, you know, in the second quarter, we had uh, you know notebook perform uh, very well. Uh, we saw a ramp of our second generation mobile product, and uh, you know that is um, due to some of the uh, additional platforms that we mentioned. Um, going into the second half of the year, um, on the desktop side, our third generation Ryzen products are uh, very well positioned. Um, you know, we expect to uh, ramp significant production uh, here in the third quarter, and um, you know, we expect that to lead to uh, share gains. And uh, we're also, um, you know, feeling quite good about the uh, the mobile products into the second half of the year. We've made progress on both consumer and commercial. Uh, you know, we had always been strong in c consumer, but on the commercial side, we have. Um, a number of new platforms as well, and those are ramping here into the second half of the year. So, you know, overall, um, I think the PC business uh, continues to be a good opportunity for us to uh, gain share through the second half of the year. Got it. Thank you. And and as a, a follow-up for me, uh, a couple things for, for Devinder. Um, I wonder if, if you might talk about the margin or gross margin differential between some of the new 7 nanometer products that you're rolling out versus um, some of the predecessor products that were either on 12 or 14, just so we can get an understanding of magnitude. And, and before you take that, just congrats on, on um, cash positive for the company overall, even, even in um, some yeah. of that convertible. Okay, yeah. So on the margin side, the new products, as we have said previously in aggregate, are greater than 50% margin. And so as we launch the new products, in particular on the 7 nanometer node, uh, those are, you know, accretive, and that's why you know, you see us updating the guidance in terms of the margin, not just for the quarter in Q3, but also for the year. And and from that standpoint, as the product mix gets richer with more 7 nanometer uh, products ramping, that should benefit the gross margin. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Hans Mosesman from Rosenblatt Securities. Your line is now live. Thanks, guys. Congrats on the execution with the 7 nanometer. Um, Hey, Lisa, are you guys constrained in terms of 7 nanometer at TSM? Uh, Hans, yes. So uh, we do have a number of products ramping at uh, TSMC in 7 nanometer, and um, we are not constrained per se. Um, I will say that cycle times of 7 nanometer are longer, and so you know, it just takes more time to ramp up, but we are not uh, constrained. TSMC has uh, supported us quite well. Great. And can you give us a sense, if you can, on 7 nanometer high-end Navi and uh, and mobile 7 nanometer CPUs, if, if you can? Thanks. Uh, Hans, you you asked the uh, the the good product questions. I would say they are coming. Um, you know, you should expect that um, our execution on on those are are on track, and um, you know we have a um, a rich 7 nanometer portfolio beyond the products that we have currently announced um, in the upcoming quarters. Thank you, Hans. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Mark Lapesis from Jefferies. Your line is now live. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, Lisa, you, you have a lot of things working for you. At uh, you got Rome, Ryzen, uh, the GPU portfolio. Where are you seeing the, the biggest upside surprise on the feedback that you were getting relative to your original expectations? Uh, yeah. So, look, Mark, I, I think um, – I think all products have really performed, you know, quite well. Um, I, I think the uh, third generation Ryzen desktop, uh, you know, both in terms of the reviews, third-party reviews, 
as well as just the customer interest. Uh, you know, what we see is, you know, obviously it's only been in market for three weeks, and so uh, you know, we watch the data points very carefully. Uh, but across the globe, we're seeing you know, sort of significant uptick in uh, our, our share um, in, uh, in the desktop market. Um, I think Navi has come out positioned very well. Uh, we're, uh, we're very pleased with our RDNA architecture. You know, Navi is the first step, and we have you know, a couple more steps going. And then uh, we'll talk much more about Epic next week. Um, I think the key thing is, you know, the uh, products have been, you know, on schedule and, uh, you know, at or above the performance. So, you know, our goal is, of course, to turn that into uh, revenue growth in the second half of the year. Oh, that, yeah, that's great, color. Thank you. And a follow-up, if I may, you, you mentioned the, the Gen 5 game console um, wins at Microsoft and Sony. Um, can you give us a sense, you know, when do these start to ramp? When they ramp, do you, do you book the revenues as you build inventory as you, as you did the previous um, generation? And is there going to be, a, should we think about anything differently on the gross margin profile? Uh, is, is it going to be similar to, to what you've had in the past on, on, on these things? Um, uh, uh, so just some color on the Gen, Gen 5 game consoles. Thank you. Sure. So, Mark, we're, we're proud of the uh, wins at Sony and Microsoft. Those are big wins for us, and as you know, over uh, many years. Um, you know, we, we can't comment on specific customers and their ramp profiles. Um, the only thing I will say is you can expect that, you know, in general, consumer ramps are second half weighted, especially, um, you know, uh, weighted towards the holiday season. So, you know, you would expect that. And then as it relates to the gross margin profiles, uh, you know, with our semi-custom business model, I think the margins uh, will be um, under the corporate average. Um, however, our business model is actually quite different. You know, if you look forward to our business model, the, uh, the, the growth that we see across all of our other products, you know, Verizon, Epic, Radeon, um, is actually quite significant. And so the percentage of semi-custom as a percent of the overall business uh, will be lower than, you know, for example, in the last, uh, you know, last few years. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Stacy Rasgon from Bernstein Research. Your line is now live. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, for my first one, I want to follow up on that second half gross margin question again. I want to put some numbers behind it. Um, so you're guiding 43% for Q3. Your implied guidance for Q4 is 43% and maybe a little under. It's only up about 160 bits year over year and flat sequentially, but you're guiding Q4 revenues up over 50% year over year. And consoles have to be falling like 40 to 50% sequentially. So the mix must be massively switching over to the new products that in aggregate have gross margins over 50%. Why are gross margins only being guided up like 160 bips a year over year in Q4, given that kind of a revenue trajectory? And why are they only flat sequentially, even with revenues growing over 20% sequen quarter of quarter into Q4? I just, I don't understand. Yeah, Stacey, let me start, and then, uh, you know, maybe uh, Devinder can add to it. So, look, you know, we, we guide approximately to, uh, to full uh, margin points. Um, what you should expect as we go from Q3 to Q4 is that the product mix will get better. So uh, we will expect uh, more new products, um, and, uh, you know, from the standpoint of semi-custom, semi-custom will be down sequentially Q3 to Q4. And so you should expect that we are we are not implying that the margin will be down uh, in Q4, and you know we'll we'll get to the Q4 guide as we um, as we get through the next 90 days. Okay. Um, for my follow up, the 100 million dollars from Samsung. Does your 20% year over year growth, excluding the semi custom, include that 100 million dollars that wasn't in the prior guidance? And what is the impact on the gross margins of that Samsung revenue as well? Yeah, so the, the Samsung, um, uh, you know, additional revenue is included as part of the 20% year-on-year, and it offsets some weakness uh, that we have um, in, uh, in China uh, due to uh, the, uh, the entities list. Um, as to the uh, gross margin profile for that, you can expect that to be, um, you know, somewhat above corporate average. Above, so somewhat over low 40? Somewhat above corporate average. Okay, and it is in the 20%. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Thank, Stacey. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Aaron Rakers from Wells Fargo. Your line is now live. Yeah, thanks uh, for taking the question. I have one question and a follow-up as well. Uh, just building on that last kind of question, um, I think last, the last couple of quarters you've talked about your semi-custom business being down 
somewhere in a 20% plus range. It looks like by my math, your assumption now is that that business declines maybe as much as 40 plus percent. And so when you parse through that, you kind of factor in the Samsung uh, relationship and the, and the incremental 100 million revenue. Has your, has your estimate at all changed X those items, uh, you know, meaning revenue X, uh, X the semi-custom decline, and then also X the 100 million Samsung? Yeah, so um, let, let me try to help you, Aaron, with, with that math. So look, originally when we started the year, we thought semi-custom would be down, let's call it approximately 20%. Um, in the first half of the year, it was down more than that. And based on what we see today, uh, we would expect the full year now to be down, let's call it mid-30s, uh, you know, year on year. Um, if you talk about now the rest of the business, I think the rest of the business is, uh, is close uh, to uh, where we thought it would be, um, close, plus or minus, you know, um, you know, a couple percent. And if you think about all of the moving pieces, uh, you know, we do have um, some customers that we're not shipping to um, in China. You know, that is um, offset by, you know, the Samsung um, upside uh, and, you know, the, the new products and how they're coming in. So I, I think we are, are pretty close, uh, plus or minus, to where we thought we would be, you know, X those factors. Okay, that's very helpful. And then, you know, just looking at your, your product segmentation, I'm curious of how you, you know, think about the trajectory of the data center GPU business going forward. Um, obviously, I can appreciate that could be lumpy, but I'm just trying to understand of how you see that. Is there, is there a point in time where we can actually get some better visibility uh, into that incremental growth driver uh, or revenue stream going forward? Thank you. Yeah, no. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fair comment. Um, it is a little bit lumpy, you know, because um, you know of its size and um, it's uh, fairly concentrated in a couple of customers. Um, I will say that we're going to see very nice year-over-year -year growth this year, and uh, you know we see um, good customer momentum um, across both cloud as well as HPC. Um, on the cloud side, it is both um, you know let's call it cloud streaming slash gaming as well as machine learning. And on the HPC side, uh, you know, the Frontier win is the public win, uh, but we have uh, you know, a number of others that we're working as well. So um, you know, I think we will give more color as we go forward, but it, it continues to be a business that uh, you know, we feel will be a, a good growth driver um, over the next few years. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from David Wong from Instanet. Your line is now live. Thanks very much. Um, one small clarification and then a, a second question. The clarification, the Samsung 100 million, um, does that come in on the income statement as a revenue or is it on another line as a, as a special item or something? It's, it's, it's revenue. Uh, so it's revenue and then offset by some specific development co uh, cost that also in COGS. And like Lisa said earlier, the, the margin when you take the revenue and the COGS offset uh, is somewhat above corporate average. Okay, excellent. And um, can you give us any numbers in terms of, for the June quarter, your sequential unit growth in desktop and notebook processor units and uh, uh, the sales growth in PC GPUs? Um, let's see, David. So the, uh, in the, your question is about the second quarter? That's correct, yes. Yes, so in the second quarter we saw sequentially mobile units up and we saw desktop units down. And the desktop units down is uh, somewhat due to the seasonality in the second quarter, as well as the fact that we were going through a product transition as we were uh, preparing for the third generation launch, which happened at the very end of the quarter. Um, in terms of uh, graphics, uh, you know, we were um, up um, double digits uh, sequentially, and that's you know, both you know, units and revenue uh, statement um, as it relates to, and that was driven primarily by the graphics channel. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Joe Moore from Morgan Stanley. Your line is now live. Great. Thank you. Um, so of your full, core, your full year guidance, mid-single digit, if I sort of project 5%, you need to get to, to a $2.2 .2 billion number for the December quarter. You know, I guess how literally should I take that? Is there anything, you know, I understand there's a lot of product momentum, but that still seems like a big number. Just anything we should understand in terms of seasonality or, or things that would kind of give you confidence in mid-single digit for the full year still? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, Joe, our, our view is um, that we have significant amount of product, um, you know, launches to happen. So, you know, as we go through the third quarter um, and the fourth quarter, 
um, both on the PC side, uh, the GPU side, as well as um, on the server side. So yes, uh, it is significant growth, and you know I think we feel you know good about um, you know sort of the drivers there. Okay, great. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from John Pitzer from Credit Suisse. Your line is now live. Yeah, good afternoon, you guys. Thanks for letting me ask a question, and, and congratulations, Lisa, on the solid results. Pa apologize if I missed this, Lisa. Just going back to the Samsung revenue, is that $100 million all coming into the calendar fourth quarter, or will there be some in the September quarter as well? Uh, yes, um, John. So that $100 million is approximately $100 million for the year. Uh, there was um, a little bit in Q2, and then uh, the rest will be in Q3 and Q4. Is there a linearity you can talk about on that, or is it should we just kind of evenly split it between Q3 and Q4? Um, uh, I, I think that's close. Okay. Uh, and then just a similar question on bridging sort of the gap between your Q3 guide and your full-year guide as it pertains to OPEX. If you look at kind of the, the full-year guide you're giving on OPEX, it could imply that, that op OPEX dollars are actually flat to down sequentially in Q4 on pretty meaningful revenue growth which is great leverage and, and understandable in the SG&A line, but I'm just kind of curious how we should be thinking or how you're thinking about the R&D spend um, as you start to see revenue begin to accelerate again. Look, I think you should expect that, um, you know, OPEX should be flattish, you know, as we go, um, you know, through the rest of the year. And, you know, we have increased OPEX. Obviously, the first half of the year was, um, you know, higher OPEX as a percentage of revenue. Uh, we are um, investing in the right places, and um, you know I think the the product execution shows that. You know we we will evaluate um, obviously in 2020 as we look through the um, uh, the overall revenue growth picture. You know what we'll do with OpEx, but I think we've made the right investments, and you know we'll continue to do so. And John, if if you're if you're looking at you know additional uh, data since you're doing the math, you know we expect OpEx to be approximately 30% uh, for 2019. Uh, if you take Q3 and Q4 into consideration. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Ross Seymour from Deutsche Bank. Your line is now live. Hi, guys. Thanks for letting me ask a question. Lisa, maybe this is something you'll address next week on the uh, the Rome launch, but in aggregate, now that we're this much closer to the, the launch in the second half ramp, which you sound very confident on, a year ago you talked about the market share goals. I think it was uh, double-digit market share four to six quarters after you hit the 5% market share. Any sort of update on, on the timing and or comfort around hitting that target? Yeah, so I think for us, we feel good about that being the right target. Um, I'm not ready to update that yet. I think we want to you know, get through. There's a lot of platforms to launch here in the third quarter and uh, in the fourth quarter. We'd like to get through some of that. Uh, but we feel that you know the target's the right target. You know the product is is certainly performing well, and now it's about uh, helping our customers get their platforms to market as soon as possible. Got it. Thanks for that. A quick follow up. Uh, it was part of a prior question uh, that I don't think I heard the answer to. But is the accounting for the semi custom ramp, whenever it may occur next year, the same insofar as when you build it, you recognize the revenue? So even if the customer tends the ramp and consumer in the second half of the year, you guys obviously have to build and, and get the inventory staged, et cetera, much earlier than that, and therefore that would be revenue? Or does something change accounting wise that that's no longer true? Yeah, no, that was asked earlier, and I, I don't think I, uh, I responded to it. Um, the, the accounting is the same, so I don't think the accounting changes. The, the only difference, though, is um, we, we, tend, we would not um, ramp a product prior to qualification. So there are some, you know, when you're doing a brand new product, there is a, a more involved qualification cycle. And, uh, and so, um, you know, I, I think there would be, uh, you know, it would be more commensurate with the, the actual, you know, product shipments. So the two things would happen more simultaneously, is what you're saying? Correct. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Ambra Shivastava from BMO Capital Markets. Your line is now live. Hi. Thank you. I, I also had a clarification, Lisa. I'm, I'm not sure I, I quite understood. In the um, delta for revenues, you, you talked about semi-custom, and then you also said that China is having an impact. What specific 
product areas are those? And is that ATIC is also part of that? And then I had a follow-up for the vendor. Yeah, so uh, you know, we did have a, a small impact um, due to China. The, uh, we have several customers that are uh, now on the U.S. entities list, and uh, we stopped shipping to those customers um, in the second quarter. And so it's a small impact, um, but there is uh, impact that is offset by some of the positives in the rest of the business. So, so I'm assuming that's CPUs, desktop, and, and, and or server both, right? Um, there is uh, some PC business and there's some server business. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. And Devendra, my um, follow-up is on free cash flow. Um, the, the gap between free cash flow per share, earnings per share is massive. Uh, if, if I look at the first two quarters, uh, roughly 300 million negative free cash flow. But you're guiding for positive. Can you put for the full year? Can you put some numbers around that? Is that tens of millions, or what's the right way to think about that? Thank you. Uh, I think I think so. If if you ask PQ3, we expect to be free cash flow positive and free cash flow positive for the year. Uh, it won't be tens of millions from a year standpoint. I think it's triple digit, but I'm not going to give you a specific number. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, operator. Two more questions, please. Certainly. Our next question is coming from Blaine Curtis from Barclays. Your line is now live. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Just curious on the on the notebook market, Intel talked about some pull-ins, but also shorting the market. You're ramping products. So I was wondering if you could parse those items out because notebook was pretty strong for you in June. And just curious if that impacts any seasonality into the end of the year. Uh, sure, Blaine. Um, from our standpoint, you know, our notebook ramps were due to, to platform breadth. Um, you know, we, we ramped uh, a number of second generation uh, platforms as well as some new Chrome platforms. Um, I can't say that I can point to any particular, you know, you know pull-ins per se. Um, I think we're still expecting that, you know, we, have, we see a seasonal uplift in the second half of the year. And thanks. And then maybe just a follow-on to that. In your September guidance, if you look between the compute and graphics segment, I'm wondering between the three segments, if you can just highlight um, you know, which one you, you expect to be the strongest. Um, so, uh, I, hmm, let's see. I, I think what I would say is that, um, you know, amongst the product lines and where they are in their ramp cycle, uh, you would expect uh, perhaps PCs to be the strongest and then, um, you know, graphics and, and server uh, next. Thank you. Thank you. Our final question today is coming from Timothy R. Curry from UBS. Your line is now live. Thanks a lot. Um, Lisa, so for my first question, I just wanted to ask how you think about Sunny Custom sort of over the longer term and uh, talk, you know, maybe about cloud gaming and sort of how you think about its long-term effect on you. Because on one hand, you've done quite well with, you know, with, uh, you know, some of these big, um, you know, launches coming up, but you're also exposed to some potential cannibalization on the Sunny um, Custom side. So I'm wondering how you think about those two factors. Yeah, so... Look, I think we like, you know, sort of gaming overall. Um, so if you think about gaming overall, there's PC gaming, there's cloud gaming, and there's, then there's console gaming. Uh, you know, we believe a rich ecosystem is important. Uh, we want to have our Radeon graphics architecture across, you know, all those three segments. Uh, you know, I've been asked about the cannibalization question. I think it's too early to talk about that, you know, maybe in a few years. I mean, we, we think cloud gaming is going to be important. Uh, but it's you know too early to say whether it's uh, you know really a cannibalization thing or is it a an additive, you know getting access to more users um, overall. So you know our goal is to make sure that our architecture is uh, very friendly um, to all segments of gaming. Great, thanks. And then um, I just wanted to go back to the question that Ross just asked about um, the you know server share target. So it's not that you're not reiterating that target here. It's more that you're going to update us on a target when you launch Realm. Is that, is that the right way to think about it? Uh, no, let me, let me say it this way. I, I think we, we do stand by the target. So this, the target being you know, double digit, you know, sort of four to six quarters after the initial um, 5%, I think we feel good about that target. 